welcome to Ready Z80. It's been a few months, but I'm back to discuss Z80 optimizations. Back in the days, I was fascinated on how I can make my code as small and efficient as possible. It might have stemmed from the C language obfuscation contests. When I started to look into the Z80 instruction set, I soon realized that all program flow is handled by jump statements. It is basically a code with a whole heap of go-to statements. And go-to statements are just something you try to avoid, but that's impossible on the Z80. This is when I did some research onto how I can make my code as quick and small as possible. When coding for single board computers, which only have 2K worth of memory, every byte counts. Here are a few Z80 optimization tricks that can reduce your assembled code size and make some small speed improvements. The first trick is to use LDIR to initialize memory locations. Now what is LDIR? It stands for load, increase, repeat. That doesn't make too much sense. A more precise meaning is the contents of the memory location addressed by HL are loaded into the memory location addressed by DE. Then both DE and HL are incremented. BC is de decremented. If BC is not zero, then the program counter is decremented by two and the instruction is re-executed. That, what does that really mean? It just means copy a byte from HL to DE BC times, and it's used for block copies. But you can also use it to initialize memory locations, and this is how. So let's say you have a data location pointing to 800, and you want to default some values from 800. Let's say you want to default it to zero. A really inefficient way to do that is by XORing A, which sets it to zero, A to zero, the register A to zero, and each data location filling out, storing the value of A into the address pointing to data. In this case here, I want to fill the first 16 bytes to zero. You can do it this way. But that's kind of long and it looks ugly. A much better way to do this is to use the LDIR command. And this is how I do it. I XOR A, reset to zero, and then I point data location to HL and the next data location to DE. So remember, LDIR copies from HL to DE BC times. And here BC is F because it's 16 bytes. And I fill the first location with A, which is zero. And then I use LDIR. And this will iterate through BC times. It could be F, could be 16, could be 256. And it will fill the memory location from 800 with all zeros. Easy. The next optimization trick is the call fall through. How this works is a method will be called, so in this case do it, and do it has a bunch of other calls of the same call procedure, it's like proc, and that proc will call and return back to the next line. And then on the very last line, the last call will just fall into the proc label and the proc method and the very last return will return back to the parent call, which is where do it is. And so proc here will be called five times. Here is another example of this method, and I'll walk through it. So let's say you want to convert the letters 2 and F, or the characters 2 and F, to a seven segment display. The actual conversion process is the same for both characters. We can use the call fall through method to make this easy for us. So here I've got 2F in the accumulator, and I call the method to convert it to seven segment displays. And here's the method. Con A sets up the accumulator for the individual nipple to be converted. It first saves AF, and then it rotates left with carry four times. And this places the 2 on the lower nibble and the F on the higher nibble. And then we call this method call nibble. And call nibble here does the lookup of the seven segment display. And once it does its lookup, it will save the value into BC and return. And it will turn back up to the pop AF statement. Now the pop AF statement will restore A because we've essentially clobbered A and it will just fall through to the call nibble label directly for the next segment to be converted. And that will be the F character. And the last return here doesn't go back up to the pop here because there was no call. It goes back to the parent function. So it goes right up to the call convert A. So here's a method where you can just fall through, the code will just fall through to the call method 
and return back to the parent. This method saves you doing two calls where you don't need to. The next trick is kind of similar to the previous one, but not exactly the same. If a call is followed by a return, use JP instead. I'll explain this further. Let's say we want to print to the screen hex characters separated by a comma, so we call the routine hex dump. Hex dump will call print, will output a byte, then it will output a comma, and then it will output another byte again, and that will return back to the calling parent. Print here just outputs to the screen, the hex data, the two characters, and returns back. So the program flow will go as this, call hex dump, which will then call print, comma, and then call print. And on the last print, the return, will return back to the hex dump routine, and the hex dump routine will return back to the calling parent. But if we replace call print and return with just jump print, now when print returns for the last time, it'll return straight back to the hex dump parent method. So we've just saved a call and a return. You can actually use jump relative as well, and that will save you an extra byte. This next trick I've seen on some code, it was very clever. Sometimes a byte will have nice bits. Now I don't mean donuts, but let's have a look at this example. Let's say we have a keyboard, a hex keyboard, like so. And that keyboard, when you press the key, returns the value that it says. So a 7 will return 7 hex, and A will return A hex. Now let's say we want to just focus on those bottom four keys, 0, 4, 8, and C. So while pressing them, they'll return 0, 4, 8, and C. In binary, it looks like this. And if you look closely, there's something special about those bottom four keys. Can you see it? The first two bits, bit 0 and bit 1, are always 0. All other keys will have at least something in those bits. Because this is the case, we can do something tricky here to eliminate all the other keys and make our code a bit easier. If we rotate the bits to the right twice, we end up with 0, 1, 2 and 3. Anything else above 3 will not be a key that we want. And now it's easy just to work out which key has been pressed by comparing 0, 1, 2 or 3. And now here's an example of how you can code this method. The long way of doing this lookup here for the characters 0, 4, 8 and C is something like this. Grab the value from the keyboard, put it into A, check if carry is set, maybe that's uh, something the method will return to say no key has been pressed and it will return back to the player loop. And then we just compare, is it 0, is it 4, is it 8, or is it C? And if it's none of them, just jump back to the player routine. But because I know those bits at the end are all 0, bits 0 and 1, I can make this routine a bit more efficient and save some bytes by doing this. Here I just get the key value, repeat again if nothing's been pressed, then I rotate the bits right twice, compare 4, anything 4 or above will just return back to the player loop. And now I've got 1, 2, 3 and 4 set. I can then do what I need to do down here. Easy. One of the most clever routines I've seen is this routine to convert a hex value to ASCII. Now here's the hex and ASCII table. As you can see, there's kind of some similarities to it. So hex 3 is 33 in ASCII, but then when you get to the characters, A to F, it doesn't work out exactly the same. It skips 40, so there's no 40 hex that we want to see. So it's not just simple of adding 30 to the hex number and getting what you want. Just by looking at this, I can see a solution is by creating a table with all these values and just using a lookup using the hex value as the index. But that creates, what, an extra 16 more bytes that you might not need, or want, or have room for. If you are going to code it this way, here is how you would do it. You'll reference HL with the hex table, then index A with L, and then grab the value pointing to HL into A. And here's the hex table data. As you can see, it will take up 16 bytes plus, you know, maybe 8 or so extra up from up here. But you know what? 
that's not the best way to do it. One way to do it is by adding 90 hex to A, A is the hex value, and then doing a convert to decimal on that result. DAA adjusts for decimal. So let's say you add 9 to 3, you get 12, but there's no 12 in hex. That goes to C, and that will convert it back to 12. And then we add with carry a 40H, and then do another decimal conversion. Another way to do this is by having A as the hex value, comparing it to 10. So is it 10 or above, or below 10? We invert the carry flag, add with carry 30, and then convert to decimal. Let's now work through the first method and see how it works with two different values for A. We'll just do it in parallel here, 5 and B for A. So we add 90 to both of those figures. We get 95 and 9B, and then we convert to decimal. So 95 stays as 95, but 9B goes to 101, but we're just dropping, we'll drop the 100 and convert to one. Then we add 40 with carry, 95 has now gone to D5, and 01, which is really 101 with the carry, goes to 42. So 41 plus the carry gives you 42. And the last convert to decimal, 42 will stay the same, but D5 will get converted to 35. The ASCII equivalent for 5 is 35, and the ASCII equivalent for B is 42. And I'll leave method 2 for you to do for yourself. Let's now look at some small examples of how you can optimize your code one byte at a time. So if you need to zero the A register, you can load zero to A. A quicker method to save one byte is by XORing A. Now in all these methods, you might clobber the flags. So if you don't care about the flag status, then use this method. What about if you want to compare A is equal to zero, we can compare A with zero, or just do an OR A. That sets the zero flag the same way as compare zero, and you save one byte. What about using HL? Let's say you want to increase a value in memory. You would uh, load the value pointing to the mem memory location, here in this case value to A, increase it, and then save it back. Just use the HL register for this. Don't store it into A. Just assign HL to value, and then increase the contents of HL. That saves three bytes. And likewise, if you're just storing a value into HL, you can do it the slightly longer way, loading the value to A and then loading A to HL. Just do it directly, load the value directly to the contents of HL. That saves an extra byte. The B and C registers. So if you're assigning B and C, you can do it individually, but don't do that, just do it all in one go, B and C together. So load BC, 407F, that will save one extra byte. Using B as a loop counter, now this is should be pretty obvious, but if you have got B as a loop variable, you could decrease it and then jump non-zero back to the loop, but you'll never do that because there is a there is an instruction, DJNZ loop, that will decrease the value of B and jump if not zero, all in one go, and you save an extra byte. What about checking bits zero and bit seven? They're the end bits of the byte. You can use the bit operator, is bit zero set? If it's not set, or if it's not one, then loop. Or you can just rotate the bits to the right once, and bit number zero goes into the carry flag, and then you can just jump with carry, and that saves one byte. And it's the same thing for bit seven. Just use RLA, rotate left one with carry. The carry flag is set by bit seven, and you save a byte. Push and pop to copy 16-bit registers. Unfortunately, there's no great way to copy 16-bit registers to each other, like BC to DE, but you can use this push-pop trick. So if you have an example where you push BC onto the stack, do something, pop BC off the stack, and then set BC to DE, the stack doesn't care what's, who's popped first and which order they're popped in, so you can just push BC onto the stack, and the top of the stack, you can pop it off, and you can pop it into DE. It doesn't have to be BC. Sometimes your program runs a bit too fast, even though the CPU uh, you know, only runs at probably four megahertz, which is slow in nowadays. But these are some tricks you can use to delay the processing of your application or your program. All these delays actually don't do anything to the code. They just waste time. Sure, they modify some values, but 
they just put the values back to where they were. So no op does nothing, that means no operation. Increase and decrease HL just increases and decreases it. JR dollar plus two, that sets a relative jump to the, line, the next line down from JR because JR dollar two is two bytes. You can use any push or pop as long as you're popping and pushing the same register. And you can also exchange the stack pointer, the contents of the stack pointer with HL and exchange it back again. Now all these take a bit more extra time. How time works on the CPU is by referencing T states. Every operation has a t number of T states. So two no ops will take eight T states. And you can see here the EX stack pointer to HL takes 38 T states and that will be a longer delay. So that's some of the optimization tricks that I do use when programming for the Z80. I hope you found this useful. I've got all the contents that I've talked about in my GitHub account. You can follow the link below to have a look. And lastly, to show how many bytes you can actually save by using these methods, I've created a test file with a pre-compiler condition, an if-else condition that you can set at compile time and you can swap between optimized or not optimized. So for instance, the 0A register here, if optimized is set, it'll just do X or A. If it's not set, it'll do load A0. X or A will save one extra byte. I've set it up to be used on retro virtual machine. Have a look at my previous video on how to use that. With the optimization test, let's give it a go and compile it based on optimization mode and non-optimized mode. But currently it's optimized is set to zero, which means not optimized. Let's compile that on retro virtual machine. So ASM optimization test. The non-optimized version compiles to 192 bytes. And if I change the optimization to one, save it and recompile it again, it comes to 115 bytes, which is a whopping 77 bytes. Now I know it's only bytes and it's not a lot, but sometimes when you're compiling to 1K or 2K chips, you don't have a lot of memory to spare. And these optimizations could save you that extra bit of bytes that you need for the hardware you're using it for. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. You've learned a bit about Z80 optimization. These optimizations aren't all mine. I found them on the web. I've added some links also to the description where you can find these optimizations and others as well. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and see you next time.